Welcome, everybody, uh, to the London School of Economics. So I'm uh, Wouter Den Haan. I'm a professor here at the uh, LSE. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker, the Honorable Jean-Yves Duclos. Uh, but before doing so, I'd like to make a couple announcements. Uh, please turn your mobile phone on silent. <laughs> I ask that every time. And still, now and then, somebody manages to make an awkward sound, and it's always a bit embarrassing. But for those of you guys who do like to use Twitter, the hashtag is LSC Canada, I think. And it should be there. Yeah, there it is, LSE, LSE Canada. The event is being recorded. And if the technique doesn't let us down, then we should make a podcast available on the LSE events website. And the plan for this evening is that after the lecture, there will be some time for Q&A. Already. So Jean-Yves Duclos is currently the Minister of Families, Children, and Social Development of the Canadian government. But until recently, he actually was a well-published and acclaimed academic, professor of economics at the University of Laval. And his research focused on you know, lots of important topics like poverty and inequality and social welfare and the role of uh, government policies. And now you probably, probably wonder where somebody who has been successful, both as an academic and a politician, got his education. But I think he will tell you yourself. Thank you, uh, Walter. Before I, you hear the answer, let me first uh, say uh, hello to all you. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, distinguished colleagues, former colleagues and uh, dear friends and everyone else that has taken the time to come to this evening. I'm, I'm uh, pleased and honored to be here with you today and I want uh, first to thank the LSE for giving me the opportunity to speak precisely this year, which is 25 years after I received my PhD here at the LSE. And in particular I'd like to dedicate this lecture to my dear friend, Tony Atkinson, who was also my mentor and my thesis advisor, who passed away earlier this year. His work on poverty and inequality inspired me and many others around the world. When I first came to London as a young French Canadian, I was able to experience for myself the special relationship between Canada and the UK. We share more than just a queen, which is already quite a lot, we share also our deepest values. And luckily for me, when I came to the LSE, the professors of that school were willing to share with me their ideas. Our subject today is policy versus politics. I spent a career thinking about public policy, which I began here at the LSE and continued as a professor of economics in Canada. Then my Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, put me in charge of social policy, along with a 70 billion pound budget. I only became a minister in 2015, so I have not yet managed to end poverty or make housing and childcare affordable for all. I can assure you, however, that I am working very hard on that. The LSE has a proud tradition, of course, of economists who impact policy. Alumni and staff from this school account for more than a quarter of all Nobel Prizes in economics. I stood here on the shoulders of giants like Amartya Sen, who has had a great influence on my thinking on the many dimensions of well-being, as well as on the social value of liberty and diversity. This evening, I'd like to talk to you about three things. First, why I entered politics. Second, how being a politician is different from being a professor. And third, what challenges I'm trying to address as a minister. I think the best starting point for tonight is a story about how I got into politics. For 23 years, as a researcher and as a professor, I was focused on facts, not power. After I graduated from the LSE, I became a professor of economics at Laval University in Quebec City, where we find a beautiful and historical place and where there is still snow on the ground right now. 
My career was about facts. I gathered facts. I analyzed facts. And I wrote about facts. Sometimes policymakers listened. Sometimes they did not. A few years ago, the previous Canadian government de decided to increase the age of eligibility for old age pensions from 65 to 67. I became alarmed because the government of the time had conducted zero scientific study on the effects of this change, especially on the most vulnerable seniors. It did not ask how the change would impact poverty rates. It did not ask whether there was a legitimate sustainability problem to fix in the first place. It did not ask about effects on savings or work behavior. The government at that time was simply not interested in knowing who would bear the burden of the change. It was enough, it seemed, that the change suited its ideology. So I did what any economist would do. I went looking for the facts. I put together a small team of researchers and graduate students, and we assessed the likely social and, econ and economic impact of the change in the age of eligibility. We found that the change would plunge 100,000 seniors into severe poverty, seniors aged 65 and 66, every year. This represented a tripling of the poverty rate from 6 to 17%. The average senior man would have seen his income drop by 11%, while the average senior woman would have seen her income drop by 32%. Elderly women would clearly have been the worst affected. The worst impacts would have hit those least stable and least likely to adapt their work and savings behavior. These facts matter to me. And of course, they matter to vulnerable seniors. But the Canadian government at that time did not bother to count and could not be bothered to care. So I did what most economists do not do, which is to run for elected office. I happened to live in an area where a candidate from my party, the Liberal Party, had not won in over 35 years. So at the time, I felt more like Don Quixote than Winston Churchill. But to my surprise, I won. Soon after that, Prime Minister Trudeau made me mini the Minister of Families, Children, and Social Development. With a major portfolio that includes employment insurance, childcare, housing, pensions, and benefits to families and seniors. Prime Minister Trudeau also gave me a clear mandate grow the middle class and help those who are working hard to join it. Now, I should note right now that when a Canadian says middle class, I gather that the UK translation is more like working class families. And today I'll try to stick with your terms. In short, Prime Minister Trudeau asked me to help make sure that every Canadian has a real and fair chance to succeed. And this is what I've been trying to do ever since. Now, I'd like to say a few things about the transition from a professor to a politician. I want to share three main observations. First, politics is more like a team sport. As researchers, we are mostly judged on individual, on individual performance. Politics and academia is like the difference between speed skating and hockey. If you will permit me to compare to a Canadian sport that I know most Brits, most Brits do not play. Ice hockey, not field hockey, with skates and masks and sticks and a puck. In ice hockey, as in politics, you don't always have the puck. You must rely on others. You win or you lose as a team. And when the team loses, it makes no difference how right you are about the facts. Second, politics leaves far less time for thinking. As a minister, I must constantly act. Yes to this policy, no to another. I must constantly answer to journalists, to friends, and to foes. Politics demands doing. 
there can be a real trade-off between speed and perfection, and fortunately or unfortunately, speed is often crucial. Which is why I think it is all the more important that before I entered politics and before some of us enter politics, I had many calmer years to think about public policy and principles. I recall that Nelson Mandela used to say that one upside of all his years in prison was that he actually had time to think, time he no longer had in politics. Well, universities are in most respects and in most cases different from the gallows, but there is a way in which a life of deliberate thinking was an ideal preparation for politics. When I am, in on, when I am, when I am under intense pressure, pushing me, pushing me one way or another, with little time to think, I do not forget what I believe and why I believe in it. In a storm, the temptation for a politician is to turn into a leaf, flying whichever way the wind blows hardest. But what is convenient is rarely necessary or right. Third, and finally, in politics, process matters as much as policy. As a professor and as a researcher, our focus is sharing our best answer. In politics, there is more consultation and more listening to others. I spend, for instance, at least 80% of my time listening. And that is all very good. There are many, re indeed, good reasons for such, in the, for such importance given to listening. First, one has to be humble in government. We don't have all the answers. So we must listen to gather better ideas. Sometimes, also, who knows? There are professors out there who might have intelligent things to say. And as a general rule, policy-making processes that are inclusive, respectful, and representative of diverse interests and opinions lead to better results. But process also has value in itself. Citizens value the ability to have a voice in consultations leading to policy. Economists often tend to overlook this, or at least I did. A meaningful consultation process is also key to build support for a final outcome. It is true for economic policy like it is true in a courtroom. You may not get the result you want, but the outcome gains in legitimacy. In my own experience, however limited, consultation motivates those who are doing the consulting as well as those that are consulted. Continuous engagement favors people-oriented policies by reminding, among other things, public officials why they must work hard every day. Canadians also benefit from reminders that better is always possible, and continuous engagement fuels that hopeful spirit. Now, if you permit, I'd like to speak to you about the central policy challenge I am confronting as a minister. This is a challenge not only in Canada, but also in the United States, in the UK, and all over Europe. The challenge is vast inequalities, among our citizens and the threat this poses for the well-being of working class families. The challenge is serious and the threat is real. Among the symptoms, if you hadn't noticed, is a nasty tide of populism in places near and far. When people become convinced that the economic system is fundamentally unfair, that the game is rigged, that equal opportunity is an illusion, that's when people get angry. That's when people start looking for scapegoats. That's when demagogues start pointing their finger at people with a different skin color or accent or religion and saying, this must be your fault. When hardworking people feel left behind, when prosperity is reserved for the few, not for the many, when fear eclipses hope, that's when people become more interested in building walls than bridges, and we all lose. The truth is that we are in a time of economic turmoil, and it is not going to end anytime soon. 
powerful global market forces are at work. Ever more rapid technological change and continuing globalization mean that disrup disruption will continue. But the good news is that governments are not powerless. Policymakers may not be omniscient or omnipotent, but our actions can make all the difference. We can implement policies that manage the changes, that protect the vulnerable, that make our societies more fair. As a minister, this is what I've been trying to do for Canada. I would now like to give you a broad sense of inequality in Canada, as well as about the steps that my government has taken to foster greater economic and social inclusion of all our citizens. Income inequality in Canada, as measured, for instance, by the Gini coefficient, has increased significantly in the last three decades. This has been largely fueled by rapid growth in the highest incomes. In his recent paper on income, on income inequality, Michael Veal, an economics professor at McMaster University in Canada, notes that the share of total national income belonging to the richest 1% rose from 8% to 12% between 1980 and 2010, which is a considerable increase. By comparison, by comparison in the UK, the share of the richest 1% saw a similar trend over a similar time span, rising from 6% to 13%. In the US, it went from 9% to 19%, and in Sweden, it went from 4% to 9%. In a paper written with my last master's student, Mathieu Pellerin, we found that inequality in hourly wages among full-time workers doubled in Canada between 1980 and 2010. This rising wage inequality is largely explained by the growth of the top 0.1% of full-time hourly wages. My teacher and mentor, Tony Atkinson, spent a lot of time thinking about incomes of the top 1% and what it meant for societies. In Canada, over the last 30 years, the incomes of the richest 1% have risen far faster than the incomes of the 99%. The annual median wages for Canadians, adjusted for inflation, have barely grown in over four decades. For most people, the cost of essentials like rent, childcare, and tuition are growing faster than their paychecks. So Canada's working families feel, sque feel squeezed and with good reasons. And my job and the priority of my government is addressing these concerns. Success would mean inoculate, inoculating Canada against the misguided populism we have seen elsewhere. We are trying to show that inclusive growth is possible and that it works. In Canada's last election, we promised to promote more inclusive economic growth. We also promised to improve social inclusion of vulnerable groups, such as indigenous people, Canadians living in the far north, Canadians living with disabilities, women, children, immigrants, seniors, and the LGBTQ community. Now, let me tell you about some of the policies we have implemented. I will focus on changes with respect to taxes, children and seniors, and social infrastructure. One of the first actions our government took was to reduce taxes for working class families and increase them for the wealthiest 1% of Canadians. That meant that 9, 9 million working class Canadians now benefit from a significant tax cut while the richest are paying a bit more. In addition to these changes, we made major policy changes aimed at seniors and children. Last July, for instance, we introduced a new Canada child benefit which goes to parents to help pay for the cost of raising children. This is Canada's most significant social policy innovation in a generation. The benefit is far more simple, generous, and equitable than the hodgepodge of tax credits it ben and benefits it replaced. Nine out of 10 Canadian families are now receiving greater support than before, but millionaires with children are no longer receiving checks from the government. The families of nearly 
100,000 children are being lifted out of poverty in the short term. Canada's child poverty is expected to fall from 11.1% to 6.7%, which will mean the lowest level of child poverty in Canadian history. Canada has also renewed its support for its, for its seniors, whose income security has suffered in recent times. Increasing longevity, decreasing access accessibility to defined benefit pension plans, an aging population, changing lar labor market conditions, all of that has undermined income security for more Canadian seniors. Looking at current numbers, one in four families approaching retirement is not saving enough in Canada. Many seniors work their entire lives and then retire into poverty. All Canadians should have access to a dignified and secure retirement. And this is why, as I said earlier, we restored the age of eligibility to old age security benefits to 65. But we did more. We also enhanced the Canada Pension Plan to increase the share of pensionable earnings that workers receive from the plan's retirement pension. This will reduce the number of families at risk of income insecurity in retirement from 24% to 18%. All Canadian workers, because of this change, will benefit from an enhanced pension plan, particularly the working class and the working poor. The change will lead to more equal and inclusive access to a decent pension plan, greater work and saving incentives, greater support for lower income workers, and greater income security for hundreds of thousands of Canadian seniors. Finally, we significantly increased direct payments to seniors through what we call old age security and the guaranteed income supplement. All told, we increased income security for 900,000 seniors and lifted 13,000 of them out of severe poverty, 90% of them being women. I should pause here to say a few more words about my friend and mentor, Tony Atkinson. Tony was a strong advocate of a basic income, the idea that every person should unconditionally receive some minimum income support. Canada now effectively has a basic income for families with children because of the Canada Child Benefit, as well as a better basic income for seniors. As a minister, I was therefore very proud to contribute to both of these achievements in the last year. Beyond our changes to tax policy and our increased support for children and seniors, our government has dramatically increased investments in social infrastructure. We are making historic investments in childcare, housing and public transit, for instance. This is the right thing to do, and it's also the smart thing to do. My government has been willing to go into deficits to do all this because we see this infrastructure as an essential investment for an inclusive future, even while we keep an eye on our debt to GDP ratio. The justification is clear. Better income support, better childcare, better housing, and better transit are key ways to, forgive, to give every Canadian a real and fair chance to succeed. And a fairer Canada will be a more prosperous Canada. Let me now conclude. I believe that my training in economics has made me a better politician. My political values are built on core ideas in economics, efficiency, equity, and simplicity. I was also trained to value transparency because asymmetries of information often lead to bad results, and to value accountability because everyone should have the right incentives to do the right thing. Efficiency, equity, simplicity, transparency, and accountability. That's not much of a slogan, but it's a good recipe for a good government. Let me then end with a simple observation. Between the link between what I learned as a student at the LSE, the reason why I entered politics, and what I'm trying to achieve as a politician are all fundamentally linked. I care about facts, and I care about what they mean for people and policy. The facts matter. That, in three words, is my philosophy as an economist and as a, and as a, and as a politician. The facts matter 
especially the facts about how policy affects the most vulnerable. And with this, thank you very much. Um, so about the, uh, the Q&A. So the idea is we, uh, we collect a couple questions, and then there will be stewards that will hand out microphones. So please wait till you get the microphone, because otherwise nobody may hear what you're actually asking. Uh, anyone just go ahead. <coughs> You give, give the microphone over, and then you can. Yeah, just go. Just go ahead. Um, you talked about the difference between uh, academia and uh, government policy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, the Labour Party is often. British Labour Party, sorry, is often uh, mocked for being uh, more of a think tank than an actual, actual um, political party. What are your thoughts on the British election that's going to happen soon? <laughs> <laughs> just, just pass the microphone to the person right in front. Hi, hi. Um, <coughs> Viet, studying Master of Science in Economics here, and I'm from Canada as well. Often talking about public policy issues in Canada, you have to talk about First Nations issues. So I would love to hear some of your thoughts on the kind of policies that you're thinking about or have already developed regarding First Nations communities. Does it work? Hello? Can you hear me? Um, I was just wondering, um, I'm sure you have many competent uh, people who are working for you and who do research for you. Um, but do you still do research yourself? Do you still sit down and read things, or do you not have the time for that anymore? Should I try that? I ah, can try that, thank you. Well, on, on the uh, British election, I, uh, not only is my uh, opinion irrelevant, because I have no vote, uh, I'm not, unfortunately I'm not a British citizen, uh, but also it's, it's, it would be ill-informed uh, I had the privilege this morning of sitting with the uh, Canadian High Commissioner, who may be in the room. She, are you in the room, uh, Janice? Okay. She, she was hoping to come, and if she had come, I would have thanked her for uh, providing me in such uh, very condensed time you know, the, the highlights of what's happening in Britain. But with my, uh, my uh, limited ability to gather and to understand the, the quite a, a huge amount of information on politics in Britain in this particular um, time uh, of uh, British history, I wasn't able to uh, end up with a, uh, a competent view on where, what you should be voting for in, uh, in June. But I trust you'll make, you'll make the right choice. <laughs> now, on, uh, on uh, indigenous uh, Canadians, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has repeated often, and in my mandate, this is very clearly uh, important, that the most important relationship between our government is with indigenous peoples. Uh, for those who know uh, indigenous peoples in Canada, you will also know that they have uh, suffered a number of traumas over the years. Uh, we owe them a renewed relationship, uh, which uh, uh, spans two uh, different lines. The first one is, uh, of course, uh, working for their children and for their families to, to, to improve the many uh, uh, dimensions of their life, and here I think of Amartya Sen, for instance, that require uh, major changes, education, health, isolation, violence, uh, stigma, uh, not even thinking of, of consumption, poverty, and so on. But more equally importantly, not only is are the outcomes important, but also the process that is going to lead to better outcomes. So a renewed relationship. Again, I signal the fact that in politics, uh, we often focus on outcomes. The process that leads to these outcomes is, is equally important. And with indigenous populations, indigenous peoples and nations, we need to have a different relationship. And this is the most important relationship on which I am working and we are working collectively as a government. And finally, uh, research. Um, a politician uh, has two, at, at least two obligations. One is to be uh, listening, as I said. The other one is to be honest. 
And, and to be honest, no, I have no time anymore to do research. However, although I have no time to do research, I enjoy reading about research in a different manner. And uh, some of us in this room who are, or, or, or who were academics, have certainly heard the views that uh, as academics we need to be more policy oriented, you know, to, to, to write more clearly and more openly about policies. That is true. In my earlier life, I thought it was true without being convinced of that. Now I'm, I'm very convinced that uh, whenever feasible and possible, and academics have many other things to do, it's important to uh, make his or one's view. Uh, about policies and politics as clearly uh, understandable as possible. And it's also true, it's also true that politicians have little time to, 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 to understand all of the important details. So, you know, something clearly accessible to policymakers is something uh, I think that is important for anyone hoping to do policy oriented research. Great. Then we'll go to the next round. Just two over here. Uh, in today's Financial Times, the main article, the Big Think article, was, was a full-page um, discussion about the increasing number of American asylum seekers who are crossing the border. Uh, there's been thousands this year so far um, seeking asylum in Canada. How does government policy um, give assistance to immigrants knowing that the sensitivity of that issue um, in the article, it mentioned that there's already a blowback, a backlash amongst certain communities in Canada. So how does the, the liberal Canadian outlook, and that it is very generous, to immigrants provide for those families, particularly children, without drawing the resentment of the local populations? Yes, thank you. My question, fairly simple, why are so many politicians so resistant to evidence-based policy making? There's one more up there. Um, oh, back, back over here. <laughs> um, I'm also a Canadian student um, finishing up my master's at LSE. Um, and in your speech, you mentioned that with the new child care benefit and as well changes to senior policy, that we have a form of basic income, but I'm wondering if you're seriously researching a policy to actually implement um, uh, a basic guaranteed income for all Canadian citizens. Thank you again. On uh, immigration, refugees, and asylum seekers, all, all societies are the same. All human nature is, uh, is universal. When, uh, when ignorance uh, is, uh, is, uh, is present, uh, soon after you'll find some fear, and then with fear you'll find hatred, and eventually that might even lead to violence. And we've seen this in Canada, in my own city just a few weeks ago. Uh, there was, for the first time, um, a, um, a, 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 a tragedy. A, a, a Canadian-born man, young man, uh, killed six uh, Muslims uh, during prayer because he felt that uh, these were these were posing a, um, a threat to his society, at least to his view of society. And uh, he was a normal young man. Uh, however, what was not normal about him is that he was. Um, clearly very uh, sensitive to um, me social media uh, information, misguided information that led him to fear, to hate, and eventually to kill uh, six of our fellow um, citizens. So uh, immigration and refugees are, are generating uh, uh, challenges everywhere. What is different in Canada, and what I hope will continue to be different, is that we believe that diversity is a source of strength as long as diversity comes with inclusion. Diversity itself can be a source of weakness, uh, severe weaknesses, <coughs> and lead to disastrous social uh, and political outcomes. But when, as we are trying to do in Canada, we combine social and economic inclusion with diversity, we all gain. Evidence-based policy, uh, it works. 
it works. It just doesn't work all the time. And, uh, and if we want it to work, then we have a shared responsibility. Politicians have to listen, and academics and uh, policy analysts have to speak. They speak clearly and openly, and to be patient, because uh, it's, a matter of, it's a matter of incremental impacts on policies. In the, the campaign uh, platform that we uh, presented in 2015 was the result of many, many years of having listened to Canadians and, and, and policy analysts. Uh, we had a very strong platform because we had been fed by a number of very dedicated and very well-informed uh, uh, organizations across the country. Finally, um, the basic income. Well, as I said, we have a basic income for about a third of families now with the Canada Child Benefit, which is a, revol a revolution uh, which moves the government away from the usual temptation of uh, boutique tax credits, not to please this group and to please this other group, and, and, and just to make it so complicated that no one really understands at the end what the tax benefit system is. So we move away from that for the families of uh, six million children. Uh, sim more simple for the government and certainly more simple for families. One benefit every month, non-taxable, received by 99% of, of families, and more equitable, no, a benefit that gives more to families that need more. Uh, for seniors, as I've said, we have a 40-year, four-decade basic income system, which works well, again, but which works well so long as we keep it uh, well, and the former government didn't believe it was important for that system to be to remain uh, as strongly as it had to be. And for other families, uh, families without children but not yet uh, seniors, the responsibility lies in the, the hands of provincial governments because unlike Britain, we are a federation, and there is there are many responsibilities that lie in in the in the domain of provinces and territories. And if we wanted to have a basic income for all other Canadians. Uh, provinces and territories would need to, to take the leadership. Right. I think there were several more people who wanted to ask a question. I think over there. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know how helpful on or unhelpful do you think the media is to governments trying to deliver their um, policy aims? I feel as though in the UK that the media at times can be a hindrance to policy makers trying to use facts to deliver inclusive policies. Um, yeah. yeah. I think there was a question over there. Next. Hi. Uh, to what extent do you feel that social policy reforms are moving moving away from providing security from life's hardships and challenges towards engineering behavioral changes in societies most vulnerable. So I point towards policies in the UK such as uh, welfare to workfare, sanctions and punishments on those out of work, the disabled and the poor. And the, almost the myth of uh, welfare dependency as a form of justification for these reforms. Hello. Uh, my question was back on the uh, indigenous question. Uh, specifically, there's a commission going on right now on murdered and missing a uh, indigenous woman. And specifically on missing women, I wanted to, to know from the point of view of policy making, how do you account, how do you manage people who are missing? Because they do not fit any governmental category. So how do you manage those people, and how do you bring a solution to that problem? Thank you. Let me start with the last question. So the, uh, you're well informed, yeah, we, uh, and that relates to an earlier question uh, that was posed um, regarding the, uh, the, the, the terrible conditions in which many of our indigenous families find themselves. Um, the symptoms of those conditions are, um, are visible in many ways, and one of them is the uh, significant level of violence uh, against uh, 
uh, indigenous uh, people, and in particular against indigenous women, both within and outside, from within and from outside the uh, indigenous communities. Uh, it's, it's a terrible uh, outcome, which uh, is in part due to the uh, effect of uh, colonization over many, many decades. And so we, uh, again, we need to consider the facts and we need to consider the policies. The facts are being gathered, as you, as you said, by this commission, which has been waiting for very, very long. Uh, it's going to be a very difficult exercise, uh, and not least for indigenous families and communities, but we need to go through that exercise and to gather the evidence that we need in order to build better policies. Uh, we were not going to wait for that to do, to do what, we, we need, with what we know we need to do, so we're, we're investing, for instance, in early learning and child care. Uh, we've, done that, we've done that since the start of the new government for children, so we start from very early on, investing in education then, investing in work opportunities, in things, basic things like health and clean water, you know, uh, which are lacking in, in, many, in many communities. So all of that, again, in, multi, in a multidimensional setting, uh, will, over time, again, it will take a long time, will improve uh, uh, housing, uh, indigenous conditions and outcomes. Uh, the principles uh, guiding the policy changes, let me take the Canada Child Benefit example. With the greater simplicity of the benefit, now we are obviously making it s more simple, less costly for the government to manage. Uh, we're also reducing errors. Uh, my PhD was on, in part on the, uh, the effect of errors uh, made by government when, when governments administer uh, benefits. My, so those of you who are old enough might remember the supplementary benefits. I don't think this language is used anymore in Britain. Who remembers uh, supplementary benefits in this room? A couple of people, very good. So the allocation of supplementary benefits was means tested and oh, was made with some errors, as, as you would expect, and so my part of my PhD thesis was to understand the, the problems caused by those complica complicated rules. Now, those complicated rules uh, often make, not always, but often make this, the benefits less equitable, and they generate uh, efficiency uh, issues regarding work and savings uh, incentives. So, in when these when you look at the complex system of the earlier government, uh, you, you, look, you find out, for instance, that marginal, effective marginal tax rates are very high, effectively discouraging work effort and savings, uh, savings effort. So the new Canada Child Benefit, because of a more simple and, and more intelligent uh, structure, increases work and savings incentives, again, while making it more simple and more equitable. And uh, I forget about the first question. Media? Media. Hmm. Uh, I know, I, I think it still is the case that in Britain, in London in particular, you know, the media environment is rich. And that's all great. In my own city, in Quebec City, the media environment is also very rich uh, with all sorts of, uh, of views and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes uh, opportunities to divide as opposed to, uh, to unite. We need to... Uh, to, uh, to value two things when it comes to media. First, freedom. Second, responsibility. Freedom is a key, the key, uh, key principle. Freedom of press is, is key in the value of our democracies. At the same time, we are... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I think the media are trying to censor me. So at the same time, uh, well, us as citizens have the right to... Uh, to, to speak openly when we feel the media are out of touch with uh, the right values that we want our, our, our society to, uh, to live on. So, you know, to, uh, to push them for better, uh, better media performance is the right thing to do whenever it's, uh, it's, it's demanded by their, uh, their, by their behavior. Okay, I think several more. Okay, over here and a second over there. The program that you covered as that from the new government seems very extensive and presumably has to be paid for. Can, since you're a professor of economics, especially in specialising in tax, can you talk about who do you see as actually ending up paying for that um, extra 
bunch of public expenditures. And I'm just mindful here that we seem to benefit from a large number of people from the continent to, that are coming here to avoid higher tax rates um, in some of the continental countries. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm another Canadian master's student here. Um, this is just in reference back to the um, question about refugees and asylum seekers in Canada. Um, you talked a lot about inclusion. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you talked a lot about um, the importance of inclusion to prevent backlash and violence. And I'm just wondering, with respect to refugees and asylum seekers, how do you balance inclusion in communities and in policies, but also the special needs of those populations with, you know, coming to Canada without having previous experience with government systems and social policies, and how do you integrate them into existing policies when, you know, balancing inclusion and their special needs? Over here. Um, so you were mentioning uh, the importance of facts and policy making, which I really uh, respect. I was wondering if there are any policy areas that you think um, that we really need to uh, uncover more facts in, if there are any specific areas for that in social policy. Good. Let's add a fourth, because I promised somebody that. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Oh, is it on? Hi. Um, as a young woman who's hoping to have a career, but maybe also start a family, although that seems like quite a long way away now, um, do you see or are you planning to make childcare and paternity and maternity leave more flexible, cheap, and useful to allow women to have a more successful chance to re-enter the workplace and effectively re-enter the workplace after having a child? Good. Who pays? Well, for some of these changes, uh, the, the, the richer, Canadians are paying. It's not because we don't like uh, the richer Canadians. We like them very much. Uh, in fact, I belong to the top 1% now, so I, uh, uh, and therefore pay more taxes than I would have paid otherwise. Uh, so the, uh, and the, the top Canadians uh, are paying more taxes, but that's in large part because they are doing uh, much better, I think, I can say that, than they would have done, they, they, they did a few decades ago. So, it's, it's, it's a matter of using the, 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 the resources uh, where, they, uh, where they belong. And so for the decrease in the middle class tax, we increase taxes on the top 1% of Canadians. For the Canada Child Benefit, we stopped sending chill, uh, checks to the more rich and to millionaire families. So we are redistributing incomes from those families that don't need the, the, that support so much, and in most cases don't want it either. You know, I, I know many, of, many friends who say, well, I don't even notice that I'm not receiving a, a check from the federal government anymore. No, I, I, not only do I, don't, do I don't need it, but I just didn't notice it either. So uh, it doesn't affect, uh, in, in most cases, their, their ability to do well. Uh, and if we don't make those investments in social infrastructure, for instance, in housing and, and, in, and to fight homelessness or to look after our young children, in particular the more vulnerable children, then there will be some that will pay. And those that will pay will be those children when they grow up. It will be those communities and those municipalities that end up with all the problems associated with homelessness um, in terms of public safety, in terms of public health. It will be, it will be those, uh, those adults that are not going to have a, a sufficiently good education to participate in the labor market later on and therefore will be left uh, depending on the, on the government. So not investing also means that in many cases others will have to pay. Inclusiveness, um, <clears throat> inclusiveness is very broad. It's inclusiveness in terms of social and economic characteristics. Why is it both social and economic? Is that because clearly economic uh, deprivation is a severe constraint to, to participate in the lives of, of communities. That's certainly uh, obvious. But there are social characteristics that also uh, limit one's ability to be well and to do well in life. And um, we've talked already about in being indigenous, uh, you know, being an immigrant in Canada, being a single parent, being a a, a single person 
of close to retirement age, but not yet there. All of these characteristics are social characteristics uh, that make those people more vulnerable. So it's, it's, a broad, it's a broad array of measures, some of them more economic, some of them more social, that makes our country more inclusive and more prosperous uh, over time. But, uh, what research agenda would I, uh, would I feel in Canada is lacking demographic uh, change. Uh, our societies are changing rapidly, uh, all sorts of reasons, and old aging of our society is one of these, uh, these, of these factors. We need in Canada more evidence, long term, uh, the ability to work for the long term uh, welfare of our society. And finally, uh, child care. Child care is very important, early learning. And it's not only child care, because child care is a bit uh, reductive, reductionist, I think we say. Uh, because we, we think of childcare as a spot where we put the child and then forget about him or her for the whole day and then come back and pick him up uh, at the end of the day with no change on his or her part. Uh, childcare is more than that. We need childcare and early learning uh, experiences for our children. Again, because uh, evidence says that for the most vulnerable children, quality learning in the early years of his or her life make a big difference, not only for the current welfare, well-being of that child, but for his or her future abilities. It's also a, ma a matter of uh, reducing poverty because uh, affordable childcare and early learning uh, makes a, a more, um, uh, more excluded uh, parents better able to participate in the labor force. Again, for economic reasons, with a lower wage, it's more difficult to participate if childcare is very expensive. And if you're a single parent, then without childcare, you're not going to be uh, having work uh, easily access to the work, the labor market. And finally, it's also very important for gender equality. Uh, in Canada, uh, in my province in particular, we've seen over the last 15 years how quality early learning and childcare makes a big difference to gender equality in our families. That's a key element of equality for, for all sorts of good reasons, and that's why it's so important to invest in it. Okay, to have another round. <coughs> Start over here at the front row. Uh, what measures do you take uh, in your office, in your daily practice, to guard against making bad decisions under pressure, and you must be under pressure <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just, just pass the microphone down the, not, not to the person who already asked the question next to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, my question about was about uh, something you just touched on, which was uh, demographic change in Canada and, and across Western countries more widely. Um, what are, uh, what are some of the government's strategies to, I mean, sort of keep healthcare costs at bay, given that they've been rising um, greatly over the past decade and even 15 years? What are some of the future strategies you guys are adopting now to try to tackle the problem now in, in working contingency with the provinces? Just pass the microphone to the person in front of you. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello. Um, at the moment in the UK and the US, there's a particular rise in popular sentiment against uh, uh, academia and against experts. Uh, so what advice would you give towards... Oh, sorry, I'm on. Hello. Hi. Hi I'm, um, I'm, I'm, can, I, can you repeat the question make sure I understand? Um, so at the moment, uh, particularly in the UK and the US, there's uh, quite a strong feeling against experts and against sort of, you know, uh, people who know facts. So what advice would you give to uh, governments and people who have the facts on their side to make their case better known to people? Um, mm. add, add one more. Just over, over here. Hi, sorry. Just wondering, uh, within the team environment of government, if you had an example of a case where you'd lost the debate and how you had to deal with that. Does I'm that sorry, sense? I was distracted. I was trying to find you and <laughs> it wasn't listening. I was, was searching with my eyes. So. It's all right here, sorry. Uh, within the team environment of government, whether you had an example of, a, of a, an occasion where you had lost the debate oh. <laughs> um, and how you dealt with that. Okay, good. Thank you. 
the uh, bad decisions, what, uh, what protection is there against making bad decisions? In, uh, in our system of government, there are uh, quite a number of, uh, of mechanisms that will tend to protect our, our country against bad decisions. And uh, let me just, for instance, mention that uh, uh, within my team, before anything else is decided, we, we need to collectively discuss whether uh, a policy is, is correct. And then that extends to a committee a cabinet committee where a proposal is, uh, is discussed and, and criticized in many cases. And then it extends to the cabinet, the full cabinet of the government, where again a, a discussion is expected. And all of these, uh, these cabinet meetings, cabinet committee meetings and cabinet meetings are being uh, scrutinized by what we call three uh, central agencies, and I think that also works in Britain. The first uh, is the, the Treasury Board, which is a very powerful central agency. The second is the, Minister, the Department of Finance. Um, I think it has a different name here in Britain. Uh, the, the Exchequer, the Chancellor of the Treasury. The Treasury. And then the, uh, the Privy Council. I'm not sure if that's, we, much, much of our traditions come from Britain. Uh, so, uh, well, and, but this being said, um, some of these words might not make a lot of sense to you. The, the, pre the Privy Council is the council of um, honorable people. Uh, in Canada, if you're a minister, you're an honorable uh, minister. So I am honorable Jean-Yves Duclos. No, I don't like that. But, but it's, it's the, it goes with the, the function. And because you're honorable, you belong to the Privy Council. You know, anyone that counsels the Queen or the King or the Queen in this case has to be honorable and therefore will belong to the Privy Council and will be assisted by the Privy Council, the Office of the Privy Council in Canada. And they also do a very severe uh, job at uh, assessing the the, the, the possibility that some decisions will be misguided. This being said, at the end, despite all of that, the decision is political. So if a government wants to put in place a bad policy, at the end, nothing will stop that government from making that change. Um, healthcare. In, in, uh, in my earlier life, I, with my, some of my colleagues, we estimated that in Quebec, my province of origin, a third of the uh, increase over the last uh, 20 years, the increase in health care spending was due to aging. Two thirds uh, was due to what we call structural cost. Structural costs related to uh, uh, things that are not related to the age of, of, of citizens. So it could be the fact that uh, chronic diseases are more important than they used to be. Technology costs more. It could be that the system is working less efficiently than it used to. So what are we going to, to try to alleviate that, knowing that healthcare is of a provincial jurisdiction? Now we're investing in home care, and we're investing in, in, in mental care, and investing in decreasing the cost of pharmaceuticals, and investing in uh, encouraging provinces to share, to test and to share innovative practices. So the federal government uh, is, is, is working with provinces and territories. That's not easy to do. Uh, those who follow the Canadian uh, situation have seen this uh, in the last few months. But we have a, a, the, the, the responsibility to do this uh, because we believe it's very important. And now people, um, why are people um, skeptical of experts? The reason, I think, is mostly because experts tend to talk about policies and things and, uh, and outcomes that are often disconnected from the lives of real people. One example is growth. Economists like to talk about growth, you know, policies that increase growth, and that's all very good. You know, we, all, we all believe, as economists, that growth, in most cases, is good. However, if you talk to, to Canadians and you tell them that growth is good, they'll say, how good is it for me? You, know, you are you're proposing policies to increase growth, but how, what impact will, will that have in my family, in my, in my, uh, in my, for my living standard? So experts will be even more relevant if, if they speak to people oriented uh, impacts. And uh, it's just a matter of language, but it's also, I think, as, as for, for some 
cases also a matter of more than language, a matter of the distributive impact of some of our policies. Okay, uh, our citizens differ in many ways and they like, to, to be, they like that to be acknowledged. So from, for some macroeconomists, for instance, and I know that, uh, of course, Professor Dan Han is not one of them, uh, all that matters is, is the impact on GDP growth. But that's not the end of it. No, to, to talk, as, as we've done as, as economists, always about the impact of aggregate growth is not sufficient for most of our, uh, for, for most of our citizens. And finally, um, what, an example of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a hockey play where, where I lost the puck. Uh, yes, I, I lose a puck often in cabinet meetings. And that's, as I said earlier, it's all right, because at the end it's to, for the team to win. So whether I am the one that scores a goal or not is, 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 is not so relevant. Uh, humility is important and confidence. Um, it's, a team, it's a team play, a team, a team, team game, as I said. And uh, in many cases, instinct will, political and scientific instinct will, uh, will prevail. And that instinct is shared unequally across the cabinet table. And sometimes you have to, to be humble, say, well, that person is, might be more right than I am, and therefore I'm, I'm willing to let him keep the puck. Great. Let's go to the other side of the room. I think there's a question over there. And then. Uh, um, I believe Canada is one of the few countries, I believe Canada is one of the few countries in the world that has a, a, a tax credit providing um, for a parent to to, um, if the child goes to a authorized sports club, the kid, the, the parent gets a, I think it's $500 a year um, per child uh, tax credit. Is that purely cosmetic, or is there any evidence to, to suggest that it has uh, benefit not only health but social inclusion? And let's try the lady at the, on the side. She's been trying for a while. So there's a new um, role regarding the um, uh, housing uh, market in Toronto, and I would like to know what is the what are the strategies to prevent um, uh, the impact of that role on other cities like Montreal, for example, and also uh, are there any uh, policies uh, to increase the availability of rental buildings in? in cities, especially after the housing reform, uh, housing policies have been tightened. Okay, and then question over there is that one, perfect. Talking about equality, um, I've, we hear a lot about the gender pay gap and uh, a lot of arguments for and against. And as someone who's, uh, well, both sides seem to cite facts that seem to be infallible. I was just wondering how uh, you, you, you perceive this and how you, you combat it. Let's add one more over here. <coughs> Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so my question relates back to the UK as well because Jeremy Corman's talking about Trident military spending, et cetera, et cetera. So I was wondering if you could talk a few a bit about um, your views on the economics of cutting back on Trident military spending, et cetera, et cetera, and the cost from uncertainty, potential terrorist attacks, and how do you see that playing out? In the context of uh, trade in which country? Trade from Canada or trade from Britain? Uh, both. <laughs> yeah. both <thank> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the sports tax credit, we eliminated that uh, last year because we, uh, we knew first that it had little impact on the actual behavior, and second, it, oh, for three reasons. Second, it was complicated. Um, I, I found that out last weekend because for the last year I had to, uh, in my tax return uh, exercise, I had to, uh, to gather 
the various forms that I needed to submit to get this, uh, this, this, this credit, which, by the way, uh, was, a, was a maximum of $150 per year, whereas the Canada Child Benefit can go up to $6,400 per year. And the third thing, the third reason is that this benefit was benefiting the, the wealthiest Canadians. For uh, prices, house prices in Toronto and Vancouver, we, yes, we, uh, we, we, um, we know how um, stressful those, uh, both the high level and the rising level of house prices in Toronto and Vancouver, how stressful it is for families, but also for businesses and for communities. Um, it creates uh, all sorts of... Uh, of difficulties for families to live well and for businesses to recruit workers, middle class, or not middle class, but working class workers, and uh, for uh, communities to address the, 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 the challenges caused by bad housing conditions, uh, children not being able to go to school easily, tra congested traffic uh, conditions, and so on. So the measure announced last uh, a few days ago for Ontario will, I think, help. Uh, for Montreal, we're not living, we know the conditions are different, so I, uh, I wouldn't expect any, anything similar uh, in the short term. For the gender pay gap, uh, education is making a difference in, in, my, in my province, and it's true elsewhere in Canada. Women are now uh, the majority in the vast, uh, in, in the largest number of, of um, uh, postgraduate uh, uh, programs. And that shows in the labor market. What also makes a difference is, again, the availability, the availability of early learning and child care services, uh, because re regardless of the increased educational and work opportunities for our mothers and women, uh, there remains a social and sometimes a physical um, reality that uh, women are expected to do more of the early learning and child care um, activities if these activities are not present outside the home. Uh, so that's going to help. Uh, and finally, um, trade. Uh, we, we have a powerful and important neighbor in Canada. Uh, we are, as everyone else in the room, um, listening carefully to uh, the, the new uh, administration and, and repeat uh, the important message, which I think also is valid here in Europe, that uh, free trade uh, in almost all cases benefits everyone. Uh, and, uh, and the free trade uh, uh, arrangements in Canada and the U.S., well, with Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, these agree agreements can be improved, but uh, they are already working quite well. So we are sending that message to the U.S., saying that uh, those arrangements are mutually beneficial for Canadian workers and businesses and for American workers and businesses as well. I think you have Time for one more round. Yeah. I know you're jet lagged because you just came in this morning, right? But all right, so there's more time. Let's, let's go over here. Hi there. Um, we seem to be talking about facts as though there's a broad agreement on what the facts are, but obviously facts come from a range of places these days. They come from academia, they come from think tanks, they come from public bodies, they come from private entities. Um, do you feel there is a lack of consensus on even the most basic of facts because of where they come from? And do you, what do you advise people in the general public to do when they have neither the time nor the uh, ability to differentiate between what facts we should believe and what facts we shouldn't believe? Over here in the middle. Oh, so further, with respect to the facts, uh, my question is about how you make sure that when people collect, they collect facts, sorry, just here. So first you have to collect facts, then you have to process them, and then after that you interpret the result of the facts. So at some point you may lose some qualitative information, and so how do you make sure that these information that you will lose can be integrated in your, in your decision making? And the second question is about perception, because you have facts and you have perception. So sometimes perception are not in phase with, with the facts. So, I mean, intellectual, you really have to uh, make sure that people, people agree with your policy. So 
how do you make sure that perception can be linked to, to, to the facts? And uh, last one is about the alternative facts. So, so we have heard about alternative facts now. Do you, <laughs> do you use them now? Okay. All right, and let's look two more on the left. So one over there. When you're making policy and you've got a policy that impacts something that's easy to measure, easy to analyze and principally impacts the government or the economy on the one side and things that are perhaps very difficult to uh, evaluate but equally impactful on perhaps a social, cultural, psychological level, how do you actually balance those? And then last question, go behind the lady. Um, sorry, I was just wondering, are your policies for gender equality mainly concentrating on easing tensions for working women, or are you also concentrating on men and their role in care work? Uh, I missed the last part of your question. Oh, are you also concentrating on increasing men's role in care work, or just easing the tensions of working women? The role of men in care work. Ah, okay, thank you. All right. Well, the first three questions were about facts. Um, for facts to, uh, to have the, their proper importance in society and in decision making in particular, we need a number of four conditions. First, we need a strong statistical agency, independent statistical agency. In Canada, we do have one. Uh, Statistics Canada has a, has a world reputation for being not only rigorous, but also independent. Although, and I don't want to be partisan, but for the sake of transparency, I would signal that the last government uh, put into place a, a force Statistics Canada to uh, stop what is called a, uh, the long form census in 2011, which meant that uh, precious, important, uh, information about Canadians uh, was not produced in 2011. Instead, the previous government forced Statistics Canada to do another survey, which at the end cost more than the long-form census and generated data of lower quality. So greater costs and lower quality for ideological reasons, because they, th they felt that you know, the information uh, didn't suit their, uh, their needs and their wishes. Uh, so strong statistical agency, a strong civil society, and that incorporates, that includes the academic, uh, uh, strong research uh, f f financing for people like my colleague here to do what he wants and what he likes to do, uh, and in a competing environment so that uh, the e efficiency of, uh, of the investment is, uh, is, uh, is encouraged. Strong media, as I said earlier, freedom of the media, that's very important, uh, regardless of how well we think they are sometimes doing their job. We need com competition across uh, the media for the better uh, facts to emerge at the end, and accountability on the part of the government. Now, in, uh, in, in Canada, uh, since with the last government, we have built on, uh, I forget the name, I should, uh, deliverology. Now, has anyone heard about deliverology in this room? Probably not, unless, except for the more experienced people in this room. Deliverology, we inherited from the British government uh, early, in the early 20, 2000s, which means that uh, uh, we have now built a system in Canada with the, the, the current government that makes it obligat obligatory uh, or compulsory for the government to, to, uh, to explain why it is um, implementing or not implementing its promises. So there is a, a, an accountability, there's an accountability uh, team in the Privy Council office that follows the, whether the government is achieving or not achieving the promises it made. Uh, interpretation of facts and how uh, that should lead to better decision making. Some of you uh, will be surprised to hear that in memorandums to cabinet, we often see references to uh, academic 
very rigorous academic work. Of course, this is, this, is, this, is, this is secret material, so unless you are in the cabinet, you don't see that papers like, uh, like papers from, uh, from Professor Den Han are being used at the highest political level, but they are used. Uh, and, uh, and that's why I think they're so important to be, uh, to, to, to be, uh, to be produced. So let's, let's avoid being too cynical about the value that governments grant to the, the importance of facts. We would be surprised to see how important the opinions and the guidance and the evidence provided by academic organizations and the civil society matter to decision making. And finally, the role of, uh, of men in the various uh, aspects of, of family life. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. I think the, uh, uh, until now, at, at least at the, at the federal level in Canada, what we've seen is a set of measures that over time should encourage a more balanced, a, a more fair um, allocation of both uh, resources and responsibilities in, in our families, in our society. There is more than that which I think we need. Uh, we have, we're sending some signals that go beyond the policies, like we have, a, 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 for the first time in history, a, a gender balance cabinet. I have heard the media, some of the media, when that was, made, that was announced last year, uh, express the fact that if, we, if you have a gender balanced cabinet, it's because it must be because you're sacrificing quality. No, you can't have a gender balanced cabinet if you, have, if you want quality. So, but that disappeared quickly because we have an Im immensely strong group of female ministers in the cabinet. They make a big difference. And, and even though they might have, on average, a slightly different background than perhaps the average men, in the cabinet, the fact that, they, that it creates diversity and different, different ways of interacting with people around the table, that generates huge benefits to both the inclusiveness and the quality of decision making at the, at the highest level. I think that uh, seems like a wonderful way to uh, conclude this evening. So to conclude, I would like to thank all of you for coming and ask you to join me in thanking our speaker one more time. Thank <laughs> you.